What a glorious morning it is. I'm all tangled up. Come on, let's all shook up. We got an Elvis impersonator on stage. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Oh, I saw Arnie walking down. I was thinking maybe he had. It could be another one. I thought he was having one of his. One of his if you're offering, Arlie's taking. That's right. <laughs> oh, look at the Oh, there's birthday. Yeah. You're welcome. 29 and counting, right? Right. <laughs> right. See, I've gotten smart about this. If you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand and um, Brother Arlie will get, get one to you. Um, a couple things to note in here. Um, <coughs> pardon me, sorry. We're having a camping trip this, this um, October 6th and 7th. It's a Friday and Saturday. If you're interested in, a tent, in going on that camping trip with us, um, it's a nice little retreat that we're going to be going on. It's going to be a five dollars fee, and you need to see see what um, Wayne called yeah. And it's at Manzano Campground. Yeah, the Manzano Just Campground. Side of the hill. Yes. It's a beautiful place. I've been I've, I've been on the other side of the campground at Red Canyon. It's beautiful up there. Um, so, um, sorry, my brain. I'm, I'm having one of those days. You got a long day ahead. Yes, I have a long day ahead of me. He can't see a senior moment. No. No, it's, a, it's called a youth pastor moment. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, oh, youth. We, this last Wednesday, we had our first tutoring night. Those of you who weren't here, well, you know what didn't happen. <laughs> We did have very many youth show up, but you know what? It's one of those things we got. We got to give us some time, and we need to be in prayer for these guys, whether they show up or not. We need to be praying for them. There's a lot of stuff going on. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kim real quick because she has something to announce. I almost made the mistake of announcing it. That's why it's tripping. That's okay. Okay. For a long time, we've been doing children's church. I think we're about four years in, except for this first Sunday of the month, and we call that family worship. Every first Sunday, we do these cool little sermon ads, and there's bulletins, and they follow Casey's sermon where the kids can mark all the words he says, and there's coloring pages, all of that. So we always have this available on the first Sunday. But starting today, on the first Sunday of the month, if the kids choose to, we're going to have Movie Sunday. So any of the kids, after Children's Story and everything, if you want to go, Follow me over, and we're going to see a Christian movie every week. I don't know. There will be different things. Every month, March, starting every with month. Veggie Tales. Okay? So it's something new. We want to make sure all the kids are aware of. Um, Casey, did you have something? I do. And I know one more for you. Um, I just want to give you an update and, and tell you what was going on with our, our tutoring on Wednesday. We had our youth from church that, that came and, and we got to help some of them with their, with their work. And we had no, zero, none outside kids that came for tutoring. So it was kind of a, a, a disappointing thing for, for all the people that we had there. Which, by the way, we had a lot of folks from, from our church, a lot of you, that stayed to help, came in Wednesday to to set up food to be available for tutoring, so I thank you. But I wanted to give you an update and tell you how things are kind of progressing. I've been talking with um, the main office. I, I talked to with, uh, some people at the school district. I am not allowed to go into the campus and personally talk to students and recruit them. I'm not allowed to hand out a flyer that says, you know, free tutoring, new life fellowship. Uh, I'm not allowed to do that. But knowing so many teachers, knowing so many people throughout the school, I've decided to do a lot of direct communication. I've been talking with teachers, uh, talking with people that I know, uh, talking directly with some families that I know that, that could use some help uh, to do some, some 
promotional things that way to, to get word out that we have a service available for these kids that could really, really benefit their academic work. Um, so I want to give you some, some encouraging news that, that those conversations are, are really being kind of fruitful. Uh, I, I got some, some teacher friends that are really excited to be uh, offering what we're doing to their students. So please, 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 if you were, were helping on, on Wednesdays, if, if you wanted to come in and help, come in and help. Please do that on Wednesday. Uh, the other thing is uh, Wayne was setting up our, our camping trip. That camping trip, there's a sign-up sheet here in the hallway. Uh, talk to Wayne, of course. Wayne has, has got uh, things set up for that. But we're going to do uh, kind of an old-fashioned camp meeting at Mazzano State Park, just on the other side of the mountain. Uh, we're going to do an overnight, if you've got an RV, if you've got a tent, if you want to, I don't know, sleep on the seat of your car, whatever. Uh, we're going to do an overnight, uh, but then we'll be there the next day. Maybe you don't want to do an overnight, maybe you want to come for the next day. Uh, we're going to be setting up some, some food, we'll do some, some barbecue, some, some grilling kinds of stuff. We're going to have some music, we'll, we'll do some, some songs, and, I don't know, maybe we'll find a pastor that wants to do a little message out there in the middle of the mountains. So, yeah. why, why, are you, why are you looking at me? Uh, I, I'm just seeing if, if there's any you know, support for that. <laughs> um, but uh, it's kind of a camp meeting. It's a time to just kind of get away from town, get in the cool mountains, and, and kind, of, kind of have some fun. But, but get, get some time with God. I'm done. You're done. I, I know how I am. You give me a mic, I'll go. Yes. So it must be lunch time. Okay, I just wanted to uh, announce and let everybody know that we're going to have a celebration for Jim's dad um, September 16th. We'll have the details next week in the bulletin, uh, the directions. It will be out in Sholey uh, towards Red Cabin uh, Campground Road. Is that what it is? at Todd Pohl's house. Um, it's going to be potluck style. And um, so the details will be in the bulletin next Sunday. All right, there's no other announcements. Miss Joanne, we have a children's sermon, do we not? We do. Awesome. Let's go ahead and pray for our children, and then we will get things going. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for the goodness you've shown us, the blessings you've given us. I'm just, I'm just in awe. Even look at the children that we have here at this church. Thank you. Please bless the messages, the children's sermon and Casey's sermon. Grant us peace. Give us wisdom on how to continue on with your plans and your direction. In your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Children, you're welcome to come forward. Please sit right in front of me. Do not sit on the stage.
one time in a place called Derrida, Louisiana, which is just 26 miles from Lake Charles. So I know about some floods and things, but I just couldn't help myself. I kept, I kept watching and I kept worrying and I kept praying and I kept thinking, Oh Lord Jesus, what, what can I do? What can I do? I'm way up here and they're way down there. Well, I was walk, watching on Fox News and they were interviewing people and lo and behold, we have a message today from Beth Moore and I thought, that just confirms what I want to say today because they interviewed Beth Moore and she said, that the hands and the feet of Jesus are working in Houston and those other places. And what she meant was that all of the volunteers, there were volunteers from churches from everywhere, and there were volunteers from, from all different organizations, and they're down there working so hard to help those people. But we're way up here, and I thought, what, Lord, can we do? What can we do? I want you to raise your hands for me. Can you raise your hands for me? Like this? You know, I thought, we also have the hands and feet of Jesus. And even though we're far, far away, there are things that we can do for those people. We can pray for those people. And I'm sure that, prop, that people in our church have prayed and prayed for those people. Some of us have even donated to worthy organizations that are in there trying to help. And even though we're far away, and I'm far away, I can pray. And my hands and my feet can be dedicated to the things that Jesus wants me to do. And so can yours. Will you promise me that you'll pray? Will you promise me that as you go about your daily life, that you'll think about the people that are less fortunate than us and just keep them in mind. It's not much to just whisper a little prayer for somebody that might be in need. You know, I love our church. Mm -hmm. I see our church as a happy place, as a place of prayer, as a pray, place of caring for other people. And I want us to pray that we'll stay that way because it serves God and it honors God and it makes a place for us to be safe and happy. You remember that? Now Howard Stencil is going to come and he's going to pray for us. Do me a favor before I begin to pray. Would you just hold hands all, all around the house? When we heard a moment ago that we have the hands of Jesus, I want you to know that you, you are there's power in touching each other. So as I pray now, just take a minute and, and feel how important you are to each other, how important you are to me and to your family, and how important you are from here all the way down to Texas. Thank you for this message that we just received. Father, I stand before a group of children, young and older, who are the promise of tomorrow. And I pray, Lord, that 
the counsel they have from the pulpit to the dinner table, the classroom, and to socializing they do with friends. That they might see the importance and the power in their lives and as they grow, understand that there's a narrow way that they may walk. And through that narrow way, as they grow older, there will be challenges and temptations. And I pray for each one sitting here that as time goes by, those temptations and challenges rise, that they'll remember this moment of touching each other in love and in unity understanding the grace and the faith that we have to follow the Lord Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've been talking for the last few weeks about lies that, that people sometimes believe about God, about the Bible, about Jesus. And today's lie, this is lie number four, this is God doesn't love you. That's a lie, by the way. God does love you. That's right. That's right. I'm here to let you know if you haven't heard. But I found some comments as I was researching this week that I thought maybe you would be interested to hear. And, and this is some folks that, that were commenting on that idea that God does not love them. Here's a person that wrote, How can you say that an all-powerful and all-loving God allows a hurricane to occur without any intervention to protect those who worship and love him. If you love someone, you will not allow them to be harmed to the utmost of your abilities. That is true love. If anyone with the slightest of morals could have stopped a disaster to save a loved one, they absolutely would have. Think about the definition of love, and then think about the natural disasters and the terrible things that an omniscient, Omnibenevolent, omnipotent being allows to happen to innocent people. A second person that was writing about this idea that, that God doesn't love us had this to say. An all-loving and all-powerful God should be able to do better than this. Millions of people starving, sending people to hell to suffer for an eternity. If you think God is loving, this person says, I think you are delusional. <laughs> the most interesting comment that I found comes from Woody Allen. You're all familiar with who Woody Allen is? Hollywood Woody Allen? Woody Allen had this to say. If God exists, I hope he has a good excuse. That's a sad, sad statement. That's right. Sad to think that... The people today can look at circumstances in the world and see and then come to a conclusion that God does not love them. Ted, your, your song I was just hearing, the hands and feet that right. Right, Joanne right. was just talking about. Amen. Mm -hmm. This first person that I, that I was reading to you was, was talking about natural disasters, about hurricanes, and, and how those kinds of things could happen. But yet your song and Joanne's lesson is about how God works through us to bring about good in, in, in those terrible situations. He does, amen. I, I wish Woody Allen could have, could, could have heard that, could, could see how God is using the church to do good things. Um, it makes me think of, of, of Paul. Paul wrote something about God's love. And, and I want to share this with you all. If you've got your Bible ready, it's going to be in Romans chapter 8. So if you've got your Bible, flip over to chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 38. But Paul writes about this love that God has for us. And how sometimes we might feel that maybe God's not loving of us, that, that, that we're separated from that love. Uh-oh, we're not working there, so we'll go back. Verse 38 says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, 
neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Right. No power in the sky above or on the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. Amen. That is Amen. revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's right. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Even when we're feeling, maybe as these people that I were, was reading to you about, talking about you know, this hurricane, maybe sometimes people don't feel that love. Is it common for people to think that God does not love them? Is that a, a common thing in our society today, that, that people have that feeling that God's not there for them? Well... That made me wonder, do we ever question God's love? Maybe you've been in that doctor's office. You've had that doctor's visit. You've had that diagnosis, and you kind of question if God was there. Maybe you got one of those 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls. You know, those are never good calls, by the way. Somebody rings your phone at 2 o'clock in the morning. It isn't to tell you that you won the lottery. That's for sure. That's right. You get one of those 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls, you wonder, does God love you? Because you know you're going to have to deal with whatever that bad news was. Maybe it's not the doctor's office. Maybe it's not the phone call. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's, it's a, a, a situation that you're dealing with with your loved ones. Do we question whether or not God loves us? Paul talks about it, and he says that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. That means that it's a 24-7, 365 kind of thing. You're right. Amen. It's there all the time. But yet, in our fallen world, where things don't go right, where people don't make wise decisions, we see situations, we, we see events, we see suffering, we see pain, and we ask, does God love us? Well, is that question common? That, that, that's my curiosity this week. Well, it turns out that that is not a question just for here and now and today. People have been asking that same question. If you got your Bible, I'm going to show you some of those questions. Oops, still not working. Let's go back. Did you know that David questioned God? If you've read through Psalms, time after time, David has to wonder where God's at. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 22, verse 1, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. Why have you forsaken me? Sounds like maybe David got one of those 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls there. Yeah. Amen. David can't be the only one that feels like that. I think we can. But David also says the same kind of sentiment here in Psalm 10. He says, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Have you ever been in that situation where you knew that God was there, you just had a hard time seeing God? You didn't feel that God was right there next to you. In Psalm 44, David asks again, he says, Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? Does it seem that sometimes God ignores us, that he's not even aware of the suffering that, that we may be going through? Well, David's not the only person that, that's kind of questioned God. Scripture's full of people that question God, question where God's at, question what God's thinking is, question does God love us. Habakkuk, I, I want to share something with you. Habakkuk was a, a prophet at the time that, that uh, Judah was not doing so well, the country's not doing well. Habakkuk says, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. 
Habakkuk saw what was going on in his society at his time and place, and he saw that people were falling away from God. He saw that things were just getting worse and worse and worse, and he wanted to know where was God in the midst of that. i got to share some good news with you. I'm all about good news. God has an answer here for Habakkuk. If you got your Bible, you look at Habakkuk 1.1. Now, you're going to have a hard time finding Habakkuk. That's probably not one of those you're familiar with. Not one of those you open to every day. But Habakkuk gets an answer. A few verses later in verse 5 in that chapter 1, God speaks to him and he says, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. God wanted to do something at that time and place that would be so totally unexpected, so totally amazing to Habakkuk, that if, even if God had said, let me tell you step by step what I'm going to do, there is no way that he would have even understood it, let alone believed that it was possible. Maybe that's the key here, is that God does things that we don't understand, that we don't see, that we don't expect, and so we think, well, where is God? When God is actually there all the time, but just not in our limited kind of ways that we look at the world. I would started by showing you David and how David was crying out and saying, where are you, God? And in Psalm 22, he asks about where is God? Anybody familiar with the very next psalm? I was showing you Psalm 22. Anybody familiar with the 23rd psalm? That might be a little bit more familiar to you than Habakkuk, probably. The 23rd psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Does that sound familiar to you all? Now, everybody knows this first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But when you go on and you read... David is at this point where he was questioning God in Psalm 22, but in Psalm 23, he realizes that God is there for him. Look what he says. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord right. forever. Amen. Does God love you? Yes. God loves does love each and every one of us. Now there is pain and, and suffering. There, there's events that happen in this world, things that are, are broken, things that, that are unfair. But that does not mean that God is not with us, that God does not love us. What that means is that we live in a fallen world. We should not be surprised when, when pain and suffering happen. Uh, a common philosophical question, a common question that, that people ask is why would God allow bad things to happen to good people? I'm a, I'm a retired school teacher. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a, a theologian. Uh, I'm not a philosopher. I'm I'm not some Habakkuk prophet of God. I have that same question. And I'll be honest. Sometimes I can't answer it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do we feel that God sometimes doesn't love us? We get those hospital diagnosis things. We get those 2 o'clock morning phone calls. I'm, I'm there. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, I went to a, 
to a Lobo game yesterday. By the way, Lobo's won. Yeah. That doesn't happen all the time, so we, we celebrate it when it does. But while I was there, I was, I was overjoyed to see a student that had been with me at La Merced years and years ago. I had lost track of, of this kid, and this kid was a wonderful student, always energetic, always, uh, always upbeat, really, really smart, smart kid. And she surprisingly found me at the game. I, I was just walking by on the concourse carrying some stuff. And she stops me and she's like, Mr. Goodson, how do you feel about running into an ex-student? <laughs> and I said, well, it would be nice if I knew who you were. <laughs> I have not seen this kid, and she's no longer a kid. I have not seen this kid in over 20-some years, 22, 23 years. And I saw her and... As soon as she even spoke her name, I was like, oh my gosh, I know exactly who you are. I know exactly who you relate to. I can tell you all the silly things that you did in class. I was like, oh my God. And so I said, tell me what you're doing. Give me an update. What's going on with you? Well, she's married and she, got her, she has her, her husband at the game with her. She's got two kids. One who was a sixth grader. I, I, I can identify with that. Um, <laughs> And she was really excited to introduce me to her sixth grade kid, you know, hey, this is my sixth grade teacher. Um, and so I started asking about her family. Like I said, I, I knew her family really well. And I found out some bad things. This girl's family had been going through an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. Uh, drug abuse. Arrests, uh, violence, uh, death, and this family, uh, as I stood there hearing, uh, as, as she was relaying all these things that had been happening in the past few years with the family, it broke my heart. When it started out as, as just a, like, oh my gosh, this kid that I haven't seen in all these years. As a joyous kind of excited thing, as I listened to her tell me what was going on in her in her family, it broke my heart. These were people that that you know years ago that I knew that that um, it was just incredible the news that I was hearing, the things that they had gone through, this girl and and, and, and the things that she had to deal with. Some bad decisions that the family members had made, some, some medical things that, that were just overwhelming. It literally broke my heart. And I, I got to kind of think of that same question. Why do bad things happen to good people? I can't be the only one that's ever asked that question. Am I, am I the only one? It seems that like sometimes we don't have a satisfactory answer to that question. We don't have a, well, here's the evidence that God loves you, that God's still in charge, that, that all those troublesome, all those painful things, all those suffering things are there because of this reason, that reason, this reason. And let me tell you, it's all going to make sense to you don't get those kinds of answers very often. In, in this girl's family's case, things just suddenly went off the rails and went far, far away from where they should have been. And we don't get those answers, at least to our satisfaction. But here's the thing. I know a few things. I know that God created a perfect world. God created this world. I know that God gave people free will. It would do no good for God to be some kind of all-powerful God running a bunch of, of robot people that were programmed to love Him. God gave us free will. And in that free will, 
people can choose to do incredibly hurtful, harmful things. So we're living in a fallen world, and we're humans that make bad decisions. When you put both of those situations together, we should not be surprised when things don't turn out all roses and puppy dogs and rainbows that we wish. But what we do have to know, what we do have to keep in our minds, is what Paul started today by saying, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Right. Nothing. We may not have all those answers of, of why and how come, but yet we have to have faith. I hate to say it, but in, in a lot of cases, everything comes down to faith. That's right. Do you have faith that God's got plans for you? By the way, plans for good. Jeremiah 29, plans for good. But yet God's plan has to work its way into our broken, fallen world. Through broken, fallen people. So when things aren't all rosy, God is still there. God is still in charge. God is still the creator that started things off perfectly. We have to remember these things. You have to hold to that faith that God is there. I, I read something this week that I want to share with you. Somebody was questioning, how can God love us? How can that be? If, if we're such a a rotten group, if, if we're so fallen, if we make such stupid decisions, if we just mess things up so much, how can God love us? So the thing I kind of want to tell you here last is that Paul was right that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And there's some proof. I was reading that someone, someone said... Take a look, take a look at Mary Magdalene. You know who Mary Magdalene is in the Bible, right? Was Mary Magdalene too sinful, too adulterous for Jesus? No. no. Take a look at David. Was David too adulterous for God? No. <clears throat> Take a look at Zacchaeus. You all know who Zacchaeus was in the Bible? We little man Zacchaeus? Was Zacchaeus too short for God? <laughs> yeah, if, if you know the song, you'll get that. And the amazing thing to remember is that God can overcome this broken world so much with this one simple question. You all know who Lazarus is, right? Was Lazarus too dead for God? No. If God can take person after person out of the Bible who makes incredibly bad decisions, David, for example, making an incredibly bad decision, if God can take situations that seemingly look hopeless, Lazarus, for example, that look much more hopeless than being dead. If God can take people in those situations and bring about incredible outcomes, then Habakkuk's message about the answer that God gave Habakkuk that you will not understand, you wouldn't even know, you wouldn't understand what I'm doing if I were to tell you. But we have to hold to that faith that God's got things under his control. And that's all because he loves us. That's my message for today. Amen. Ted, would you bring up our worship team? Well, while Ted's coming, why don't you all stand?